This will remind you that I've been here once and can return. Tyrone Power was Saturday afternoon. Oh, I just thought he was the most romantic, beautiful man I'd ever seen. You know, I wish you were in some kind of trouble. But why? Just so I could get you out of it. He wasn't arrogant. He wasn't full of himself. But I've never seen anyone as handsome as Ty. For nearly two decades, he was one of Hollywood's most popular leading men. With dark, brooding eyes and dashing good looks, he captivated audiences in historical dramas, romantic comedies, and swashbuckling epics. But for all his charm and popularity, the actor's off-screen life was a maelstrom of romantic entanglements and torturous self-doubt. Whatever the intrigues were with uh, Tyrone Power, everybody just loved him. On May 5th, 1914, in Cincinnati, Ohio, Tyrone Edmund Power was born into an illustrious theatrical family. More than a century before his birth, the child's great-grandfather, Tyrone Power I, became the toast of New York when he brought his repertoire of Irish comedies to America. Two generations later, Tyrone's father, Frederick Tyrone Power II, toured the country as a well-known Shakespearean actor with his wife, Patia, a respected actress and drama coach. In 1916, the Powers moved to Hollywood, where Tyrone Sr. found work in the burgeoning silent film industry. But after the birth of a second child, daughter Anne in 1917, the couple's marriage became strained by the popular actor's frequent backstage love affairs. When offered the lead in a Broadway musical, Tyrone Sr. hit it east leaving his wife and children behind. He tried to remain close to all the family, but he, he was gone, just <laughs> out of the picture a good part of the time. Left alone in California, Patia soon filed for divorce. The single mother supported her children with a series of acting jobs in local theater companies. She also prepared Ty and his sister for the family profession, schooling them at home in voice control, diction, and fencing. In 1921, seven-year-old Ty made his first stage appearance in the role of a young Franciscan monk. His debut impressed a reviewer for the Los Angeles Times who singled him out as a miniature hit. But Patia Power found it difficult to make ends meet in Hollywood and in 1923 returned with her children to Cincinnati. She said to her son, you have to remember to bend like a tree because life is difficult and it's got a lot of storms in it and there's heavy winds and if you don't bend, you'll break. So bend. As the jazz age dawned, Tyrone matured into a strikingly handsome young man, a young man obsessed with the stage. In his final year at Purcell High School, he starred in his class play and the yearbook proclaimed him the logical successor to John Barrymore. His father had been a, a Shakespearean actor and he wanted to emulate him. He had a letter he received from his dad giving him all this advice about his career, kind of like Shakespeare's advice to the players in Hamlet. But Ty was very proud of it and he said, I'm gonna live up to this and I'm gonna be a bigger star than my dad. In a career spanning 44 years, Tyrone Sr. had by now played opposite the most famous stars of the American stage and appeared in numerous films, including Raoul Walsh's epic western, The Big Trail. Am I supposed to wet nurse them wooden-head pilgrims cross the plains? Well, now, the more that goes along is better for them and for you, in case the Indians jump you. Like the you two have met before. No. I reckon not. The macho screen image of the veteran actor stood in sharp contrast to that of his fair-featured son. And at 16, the aspiring actor sought the guidance of his worldly father. He did feel, I think, that either Mr. Power, his father, or his great-grandfather, the other Tyrone Power, uh, would say, boy, you are following in our footsteps. Agreeing to take the boy under his wing, Tyrone Sr. planned a rugged camping trip at his summer retreat in the Canadian woods. It was here that young Ty would finally get to know the man who had abandoned him so many years before. They had their first time alone together, uh, several weeks, 
and Tyrone told him of his ambitions to be an actor and he spent most of that time trying to teach his son to project his voice. Impressed with his son's dedication, the experienced actor brought the boy to Chicago, where Power Sr. starred as Shylock in The Merchant of Venice and Junior apprenticed in a minor role. In hopes of establishing their acting dynasty in Hollywood, Tyrone Sr. next invited Ty to accompany him to California. While young Tyrone attempted to break into the business, Sr.'s work as a character actor kept the two afloat. Success seemed assured when the elder actor was assigned the title role in Paramount Pictures' The Miracle Man. But shortly after filming began, tragedy struck, when the 61-year-old actor became gravely ill. He was stricken about six weeks into that film, um, felt badly and had to stay home. And he called uh, Tyrone, and he, he was staying in a men's club, and he, Tyrone went over to him. And right away, he sensed his father wasn't well at all. On December 23rd, 1931, only six months after their summer reunion, and two days before Christmas, Tyrone Sr. suffered a massive heart attack and died in his son's arms. Now broke and alone, the teenage actor struggled to find work. But while his family name and striking good looks often opened doors, his lack of experience landed him back on the streets. Desperate, he took a small part as an extra in Universal Pictures' Tom Brown of Culver. But the lack of other film offers suggested he might have better luck on the stage. Heading to New York, Ty auditioned for Catherine Cornell and Guthrie McClintock, the impresarios of one of the nation's most prestigious theatrical companies. After being hired for several small roles, his first big break came when he was cast as Benvolio in the company's landmark production of Romeo and Juliet. When the show opened in Los Angeles in 1935, Ty was spotted by a studio talent scout who quickly offered him a seven-year film contract at $200 a week. Ty turned to his mentor, Catherine Cornell, for advice. She said, don't do it. You're not ready. She said, when you're ready, you'll get more and you'll, you'll, it will be the right time, but don't do it now. And he didn't. He, he told them no. Declining Universal's offer, Tyrone continued his stage training, appearing with Cornell in a revival of George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan. But at the end of the season, Hollywood beckoned again, and this time, the 20-year-old actor couldn't resist. It was a telegram from 20th Century Fox scout who was in New York. If he would take a screen test, oh, he, we went out and celebrated. He bought champagne, and uh, we had... We were just so excited for him. And then when he took the test and he got the contract, of course, he was on cloud nine. In 1936, the studio star system was thriving. And while Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer boasted more stars than the heavens, fledgling 20th Century Fox struggled to establish its own galaxy of talent. Shirley Temple reigned as the studio's top moneymaker and Alice Fay was its leading lady. But studio boss Daryl F. Zanuck desperately needed handsome male stars to complete his roster. In order to test his new contract player's screen appeal, Zanuck gave Ty a small but effective role in the romantic comedy Girls' Dormitory. What will it take to cheer you up? A diamond bracelet? A million francs? Or a dance with me? I don't feel like dancing. Have a drink of champagne. Or maybe I could entertain you with a few card tricks. Though given just a few lines at the end of the picture, Ty captured the attention of powerful Hollywood columnist Hedda Hopper, who claimed she sat through the movie twice just to learn the dashing bit player's name. Nevertheless, the young actor could not convince Zanuck to give him his big break. Frustrated, Ty called on his father's old colleague, director Henry King, who was beginning work on Fox's most prestigious picture of the year, Lloyd's of London. Although popular Don Amici was already slated to star, King recognized potential in power and decided to give the young man a screen test. And they 
ran the test of uh, Don Amici in costume for the Lloyds of London, and uh, then they ran the one of Tyrone. Well, all of the yes men around, Zanuck said, oh, Amici's the one, he's great, because they thought that's what Zanuck wanted to hear. But Zanuck turned to Henry King and said, well, now, which one do you want? And he said, I, I would go with power. For one thing, he's better looking. And he said, in, in a few years' time, he's going to be a great star if you do the right things for him. At 22, Tyrone Power, heir to an acting legacy, was about to embark on a career that would far exceed anything his ancestors could have imagined. Lloyd's of London was Fox's number one grossing film of 1936. In his very first major role, Tyrone Power had become a star. I'm a waiter at Lloyd's, am I? Well, I'll serve him. John, don't. I'll show him. Don't. I'll climb so high. Quiet, I'll cut a path face. so high. Don't just have him to peace it. They'll doff their hats. Get out of here. Ty was 23 when he became this gigantic star. He never seemed to be a neophyte or a gangling boy. He was a young leading man immediately. With his newfound success, Power was rewarded with a new dressing room and a raise to $350 a week. He was also receiving an astonishing 1,000 fan letters each day, many from women requesting more love scenes in his future films. Recognizing his new star's potential, Zanuck rushed power into a series of light-hearted musicals and gripping dramas. Oh, you're crazy! You're crazy! Maybe, but I was sane enough until tonight. Then I heard you sing. Oh. And something happened to me. Something swept over me I've never felt before or ever expect to feel again. What are you talking about? I'm in love with you, Bill. In just three short years, Tyrone Power would become one of the nation's top box office attractions, surpassing other stars like Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy. Somebody would say to him about, well, how was it when you first started? And he always answered the question in the same way, which I thought was so typical of him. I was the right person at the right time, and I was lucky to be there. There was a, a panache and a grace and a breeding about him that was enviable, I think, to both men and women. Mothers would like to have him take their daughters out, you know. Guys would like to have him as a brother. If the public fell in love with him, so did nearly all his female co-stars. And soon Ty began dating some of Hollywood's most famous leading ladies. Sonia Henney and Tyrone Power, just before the opening of Hollywood's latest triumph. We mustn't miss Tyrone Power escorting Janet Gaynor. What a pair. In 1939, MGM superstar Norma Shearer was so struck by the charismatic young actor that she personally requested him as her co-star in a lavish production of Marie Antoinette. But after the film opened to disappointing reviews, Zanuck vowed he would never again loan his number one leading man to another studio. Returning to Fox in Suez, an epic costume drama, Power was featured with Fox's newest European import, the glamorous French actress with one name, Annabella. At your service, mademoiselle. Make him bring back my little house. My clothes are in it. Well, why don't you come out and get them yourself? Shame on you. My dear young lady, I don't mind seeing you in your bathing dress. Oh. Shame on you. <laughs> The first time it was hello, hello. And like all the girls were crazy about him, I was a little cool not to do exactly like the others. So I called my mother, I'm going to have dinner with Tyrone Power. What? The great Tyrone Power? But you have your old suit and flat shoes. I said, it doesn't matter, mother. He asked me to go out for dinner. Power was smitten and the elegant French actress and Hollywood's favorite leading man soon became inseparable. But Zanuck disapproved of the match. Bachelors, the boss believed, made for better box office. 
Zanuck wanted to keep him in that, that, that uh, role of the glorious matinee idol that all the girls would absolutely flip over. The shop girl in the supermarket, whatever it might be, could dream of saying, you know, maybe I could meet him and, and I'd, I'd be Mrs. Tyrone Power one day. In an attempt to squelch the romance, Zanuck ordered Annabella to Europe to shoot a slate of pictures. Refusing to go, she was placed on studio suspension. Annabella, being a very strong-willed lady, uh, knew that she was fighting Zanuck a good part of the time. Tyrone, he had maybe one little fault. He didn't know enough to say no to somebody like Mr. Zanuck. I'm sure he wanted Tyrone to belong to Fox. Didn't stop my love for Tyrone, uh, Tyrone's love for me. The romantic Hollywood wedding of the 20th century Fox star, king of the screen, and the charm girl from France. Their marriage, long rumored, has now occurred. Tyrone Power and Annabella are now two stars that twinkle as one. Now married, despite Zanuck's strenuous objections, Tyrone Power and Annabella sail to Europe for their honeymoon. Soon after returning home, Tyrone adopted Annabella's daughter, Annie, and the new family moved into a stately house on Salt Air Boulevard in Brentwood, California. This was a very close little neighborhood in those days. Gary and Rocky Cooper lived right across the, the street, and uh, then Keenan Wynn lived caddy corner of the, the Coopers. Every Sunday morning, this whole group of motorcycle nuts would come to our house, roaring into the, into the back entrance. Tyrone, Watson Webb, Clark Gable, Fred McMurray, Cesar Romero, whom we all called Butch. They were so handsome, you couldn't believe it. They had these big goggles on and the mud all over them. Happy as clams, they were so thrilled. And then they'd start, you know, having a nice little drink or two and swap stories about who did what to whom and who, who splattered the most mud on somebody, whose motorcycle went out and fell down the hill. It was fun, very cheerful, and full of friendship and heart. That was the most important. We are all the time kidding and, and having fun. But while purchasing their dream house, the couple made a shocking discovery. Tyrone Power, one of the most successful actors in Hollywood, was almost broke. Uncle Frank Adams, uh, who was his business manager and agent, and who had been a great friend of his father's, said, well, there's no money for you to buy a house like that. And they found that uh, Mr. Adams was skimming off a huge percentage of his income for handling his money. He didn't like to have to face issues if it was going to be unpleasant. He'd rather walk away from it if he could. Tyrone hated that kind of scene. Uncle Frank was a, a member of the family, so it was kind of brushed under the carpet. Uncle Frank was fired, and Ty was forced to let Annabella pay for the house. Never one to bring his personal problems to work, however, Ty maintained a reputation as something of a practical joker. We were wicked then. We had fun. Now, you know, like a dressing room, you know, they're great big square boxes and they're on wheels. Well, we're on location, and Ty and Don get out in the back and push this dressing room and let it go. And, I, and I'm telling you, with a hairdresser and a wardrobe woman and myself in it, it's pretty dangerous. In 1940, he secretly filmed this scene for The Mark of Zorro and slipped it into Zanuck's daily screening. This time, Excellency, I take only your money. Next time... <laughs> Zanuck! And let that be a lesson to you, damn it. Adios. With the mark of Zorro, Tyrone Power inherited one of Douglas Fairbanks' most famous roles and the mantle of America's most popular swashbuckling hero. I needed that scratch to awaken me. In Blood and Sand, released the next year, he reinvented the part of a swaggering matador, once made famous by Rudolph Valentino. I dedicate the death of this noble bull to the beauty of the women of Spain. 
The Hollywood heartthrob was now a box office sensation. But as Ty and Annabella began their fourth year of marriage, the public couple wrestled with a very private pain. He very, very much wanted a son, and Annabella very, very much wanted to give him a son. I mean, he had the thing about the Tyrone Power name going on, but I think it was more an obsession with Annabella than it was with Tyrone that she couldn't give him the son. I think it frustrated her more. As a further strain on the marriage, rumors of Tyrone's extramarital affairs began to circulate around Hollywood. Sure, he had a couple of flings that everybody knows about. They were numerous, uh, but they, uh, there were some important ones. And one, of course, was Judy Garland, who was crazy about Tyrone. When the affair with Garland developed into a serious romance, the high-strung superstar pressured Tyrone to leave his wife. He wanted to be all things to all people, and you couldn't. He would, like, divide himself up into little millions of pieces of you know, for people that wanted this or wanted that, and it just, it just couldn't be. While domestic conflicts were erupting in the power home, a much greater battle had begun in Europe. England and France declared war on Germany, and the United States was on the brink of joining the fray. Zanuck drafted power and pin-up girl Betty Grable for a strategic piece of pre-war propaganda, a yank in the RAF. Well, I haven't looked at another girl since you left. Well, I've looked at other men. Maybe, but I'll bet you didn't look at him the same way you looked at me that first night in Kansas City. Remember? You were going east and I was going west. And we saw each other and I was going east too. And the same old spark still there, honey. Sure, we've been off course a few times, but we can get back on again. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, power enlisted for real as a flyer in the U.S. Marine Corps. An experienced pilot, he wanted a chance to show that he was not just a Hollywood pretty boy. But yet another obstacle stood in his way. He would like to have gone into the service right after he signed up, but it was Zanuck uh, who requested that he be allowed to do crash dive. Zanuck felt, and the, and the, the armed services also felt, that it would increase uh, volunteers. Sub's been stalking that lifeboat, trying to knock off a rescue ship. We'll see what we can do for him. On January 1st, 1943, Tyrone Power reported for active military duty at Camp Pendleton. Left behind was an uncertain marriage and a career of wealth and privilege. Awaiting him was a world and a life that would be changed forever. In 1944, the world was at war, and Tyrone Power, international matinee idol and star of over 25 films, was a lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Air Corps. He loved flying. He loved excitement, and he loved danger. He had a wonderful war record, and he was an extremely good pilot. And he said, it's different when you're not in a movie with a uniform. He said, it, when it's really you, and he said, it's very satisfactory. But while battling the enemy, Ty also battled his conscience. And when the 30-year-old actor returned from the war, he decided to repair his failing marriage to Annabella. Lieutenant Tyrone Power, the 20th Century Fox motion picture star, is welcomed home by his wife after war and battle as a Marine Corps pilot. When he came back from the war, when we found each other again, that was marvelous. Canada's wind and snow whip up a welcome for Tyrone Power and his wife, Annabella. After three years of fighting in the warm Pacific, Tyrone chose Canada's wintry blasts for a vacation, and it looks as if he got them. They're going to enjoy this reunion. Tyrone's out of service now after a distinguished record that included participation in the campaigns at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. They were never like this. For his return to the screen, Zana cast power in The Razor's Edge, a powerful adaptation of Somerset Maugham's classic novel. All the things that had been confused before suddenly became clear to me. I had a sense of knowledge more than human. I felt that I'd broken away and was free. 
The film captured the hearts of post-war audiences searching for more realistic, mature dramas, and went on to earn an Academy Award nomination as Best Picture. His box office status secured, Power next begged Zanuck to let him star in Nightmare Alley, an uncompromising drama concerning a carnival con man whose web of lies leads to a downward spiral of despair and degradation. I see fields of grass and rolling hills and a boy. A barefoot boy is running through those hills. A dog is with him. A dog is with him. Yeah, his name is Don. Go on. <laughs> hey, see how easy it is to hook him? Stock reading fits anybody. Never misses. Of course, Zanuck didn't want um, power to do Nightmare Alley. If you're a studio head and had this great star suddenly want to oct, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, didn't sit well. The role of Stan Carlyle was his finest to date and became his personal favorite. But the actor felt betrayed when the studio rushed the film in and out of movie houses, giving it little publicity. I think then he felt resentment that Zanuck is still being the patriarch. I've still my apprenticeship. I feel that we ought to be more partners than it is son and father, you totally controlling me. As Tyrone's relationship with Zanuck deteriorated, so did his marriage. Though the couple had tried to resolve their differences, in 1947, Ty and Annabella separated and later divorced. He didn't leave Annabella for anybody else. And I will swear on a stack of Bibles that high that that's true. There was nobody else in the picture, but she was really the one that said it's time for us to call quits because I'm never going to be able to give you that son that you want. And there was never one bit of either uh, bitterness or anger or anything. After his divorce from Annabella, rumors began to spread concerning Ty's ambivalent sexual preferences. There was a duality in Tyrone uh, from a sexual point of view, but the men in Tyrone's life never complicated his life, and the women gave him a big headache. After a brief and highly publicized romance with actress Lana Turner, Ty surprised everyone by announcing plans to fly his plane around the world with actor and good friend Cesar Romero. Tyrone Power and Cesar Romero are off on a vacation. Wonder where they're going. Well, we're going to start off with Mexico, then go to Guatemala and the other Central American republics. At the Roman Colosseum, Tyrone Power in Italy, and the 20th Century Fox star tosses a coin into the Trevi Fountain. Ty's life as an eligible bachelor was cut short in Italy when he met young MGM film star Linda Christian. When he opened the door to his fabulous suite, all the bells of Rome started to ring. I don't know, it was incredible. And uh, it was actually the telephone that was ringing. And it was Lana saying, uh, where have you been all evening? Tell me that you love me. And then he looked at me and he said, I love you. And that was that. Following a much publicized courtship, Ty and Linda married in Rome in January 1949. Tyrone Power's bride, Linda Christian, enters the ancient church of Santa Francesco Romana to wed her hero. She's almost an hour late, but Ty waits happily. Will you take younger Rosa here present for your lawful wife according to the right of our Holy Mother, the Church? I will. All of Rome was just along this street and up the, the monuments and on the trees and on the lampposts. And I was late because I couldn't get through the throngs. But when the actor returned home, he was disappointed with his next role that of a swashbuckling hero in a modestly budgeted costume drama. Yes, Esteban, it's me, Orsini. In Prince of Foxes, Power looked tired and older than his 36 years. In 1950, for the first time in 12 years, he failed to rank in the top 10 of U.S. box office attractions. Despite his career frustrations, Ty's life took a bright turn when Linda gave birth to a daughter, Romina Francesca. 
But when Zernick featured power in a series of second-rate films that neither impressed audiences nor challenged his talent, the actor knew that his days at Fox were numbered. You have taken two captives from the country of the Long Knives. The pony soldier speaks with a tongue of the snake that rattles. It is standing bear who speaks with a forked tongue. He didn't really feel that he had achieved what he wanted to achieve as Tyrone Power actor. Tyrone Power movie star, yeah, he knew that. But that wasn't the thing that was all important to him. Then he started to become a little impatient and wanted better films and better roles and, and uh, was looking forward to the time that he wouldn't be on the contract and that he could choose his own material. Tyrone Power had made over 40 films and become an international superstar. But when his contract came up for renewal, he refused to negotiate, terminating one of the longest exclusive contracts in Hollywood history. For the first time in 20 years, the actor was free to choose his own roles, live his own life, and make his own mistakes. Away from what he jokingly called penitentiary fox, Power discovered a new and invigorating freedom. He was just pleased to be out from Zanuck's thumb of Zanuck really saying, you are going to do this. He just felt that with his track record of what he'd done in the business, he would like more say with the producer of what kind of picture he would do. But with freedom came responsibility, and he was faced with an immediate dilemma during the casting of his first project. Mississippi Gambler, which was his first independent film, which we were supposed to have done together as the power team. I had to uh, screen test. Uh, my competition was Linda Christian, Tyrone Power's wife. I had to walk on the, the burning coals to, to get the part. I was very disappointed, and I let him know that he should have been firmer. When Piper Laurie won the starring role, Tyrone generously gave his co-star some advice. He told me about a trick. When you're doing a love scene, look at, look at your partner's eyes and, and then down at his mouth and then back to the eyes and then down to the mouth. He said it's very effective. 20 years under Zanuck's tutelage had taught Tyrone how to make a successful film and Mississippi Gambler netted him over a million dollars. 20th Century Fox this week changed its entire production technique for all of its principal pictures and started the production of Lloyd C. Douglas's famed story, The Robe, in Cinemascope. With The Robe, Daryl Zanuck thought he had the perfect vehicle to lure power back to Fox. But although Tyrone signed the contract to star, he began having second thoughts. He loved the theater, and he had had it with, with movies for a while. He just wanted to renew himself, you know, revivify to, by doing, trotting the boards, as he put it. Withdrawing from the film, Power made the rather risky decision to co-star in a staged reading of Stephen Vincent Benet's epic Civil War verse, John Brown's Body. But when the show premiered in New York, critics hailed it, the most exciting theater event of the season singling out Power's extraordinary performance. Touring with the show for more than a year, he turned down one film role after another. John Brown's body lies a smoldering in his grave or whatever. I thought that he was wasting his talent and his energies doing all these different theater things and taking him away from home. And I'd say, you can do a most beautiful film and that will reach the whole world. Why just, just a limited audience? Inevitably, Ty's theatrical life took its toll on an already crumbling marriage. Naturally, the women would be at his command and call or whatever you call it. And I would get these rumors that he wasn't alone. And then Tyrone came home and he said, but why, why do you worry? Why don't you get yourself a lover too? After Linda's highly publicized affair with screen actor Edmund Purdom, and despite the birth of a second daughter, Taryn Stephanie, in September of 1953, Ty and Linda decided to divorce. I think if she were to do it over or could do it over, she would have uh, probably preferred to dedicate herself to one man and a family. Uh, it just didn't really work out that way. A bachelor once more, Ty was on his own and looking for work. 
A welcome offer came from an old friend, director Henry King, who asked him to return to Fox for King of the Kyber Rifles. If there is a man among you who will not follow me, let him step forward now and make himself known. I had the lead opposite him in King of the Kyber Rifles. The first scene was a big love scene. I haven't even met him. And Tyrone Power comes in, and my eye started twitching. I mean, there's nothing you can do. And Tyrone, he, was, he just took over. He said, Henry, I don't know my lines. Do you mind if Miss Moore and I go and sit on the side and, uh, and maybe she can help me? So we went over there for about a half an hour. We went over the lines. Of course, he knew them. But he was just so kind. He knew that I was just so completely distraught and nervous. Hold me in your arms, Helen. And tell me just once what we both know to be true. Although he could still cast quite a spell on women, the 40-year-old actor found it difficult to find mature, serious roles. In 1955, he found just the right part, playing Eddie Duchin in the fictional biography of the famed pianist. It's a rare and wonderful experience for any actor to be able to to recreate the life of a close personal friend, particularly when that life is as exciting and dramatic as Eddie Duchin's. I went to the studio to watch him. He wanted me to watch him practice the piano. <laughs> this is going to be interesting because I knew he didn't play. So he had a piano that didn't make any sound. And he learned all the fingering exactly like Eddie Duchin did it. He was such a perfectionist. His perfectionism paid off, and the Eddie Duchin story became one of the top-grossing movies of the year. In 1957, Power formed his own company, Copa Productions, and released the taut and suspenseful Abandoned Ship. There were 26 survivors in a lifeboat meant for 12. But you must have sent a distress signal. You had seven minutes. You must have sent an SOS and got an acknowledgement. One man alone had to say who was to live. I'll hang you for it, Holmes! And with my blessing! And who was to die? By now, the middle-aged matinee idol had proven that he could thrive outside the studio that had nurtured him for so long. But haunting him was a responsibility to his family and his father that he was unable to ignore. Since boyhood, Tyrone Power had been both blessed and burdened by his theatrical heritage. If you go to Grauman's Chinese and you look at what he uh, said in cement, uh, following in my father's footsteps, that meant a lot to him. There was tremendous feeling of being another Tyrone Power who would be remembered as an actor. At 43, Tyrone had reached the stage in his career when he was no longer a prisoner of his pretty face. Years of training and experience recommended him for a variety of more challenging roles. In 1958, director Billy Wilder cast Power as the charming but devious defendant in Agatha Christie's suspenseful courtroom drama, Witness for the Prosecution. You killed Emily French. No, I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't kill her. I never killed anybody. He wanted to be that character who was really very spiteful and vengeful. I just didn't understand him wanting it, but he said, you see, it's different. And I, I, I played those sappy parts and pretty boys, and I don't want to do that anymore. The picture became a box office success, and critics applauded Power's work as magnificent. In May 1958, Power married again, this time to Deborah Ann Menardo, a free spirit in her mid-twenties who had dated Elvis Presley. Well, he still wanted a son, and we used to talk about it a lot. When he went with Debbie, she told him she would have a boy for him. He said, I have to have a son. Several months after the wedding, Debbie announced her pregnancy. Though devoted to his daughters, the actor fervently hoped for a boy who would carry on the power dynasty. He said to me, Terry, if I die tomorrow, I wouldn't mind. He said, I've had such a wonderful life. He said, I can't think of anything else I could ever experience. It's been so grand and wonderful. And he said, wait, there's only two things I would like. I would like a son, and I would like to die on stage. 
Later that year, in memory of his father's death, Power filmed this public service announcement for the American Heart Association. For all of us, the most precious element we have is time. But time runs out too soon for millions because of a health enemy that takes more lives than all other diseases combined. That's why, ten years ago, our leading physicians and scientists declared all-out war on heart disease. So give generously to your heart association, knowing that your heart fund dollars will come home to help safeguard your heart and the hearts you love. Still strikingly handsome, the star wore the beard he had grown for his upcoming role in Solomon and Sheba. The filming of the biblical epic on location in Spain was physically and emotionally grueling. Copa Productions, Ty's own company, was producing the picture, and the stress and responsibility weighed heavily on him. Of greater concern was the actor's physical condition. During a routine medical examination, his doctor had requested a second cardiogram. Power declined. If there's something wrong, he said, I don't want to know. And then he had to do a uh, dueling scene with George Saunders. And George Saunders was not a swordsman. So they had retake after retake. And Tarun was getting wearier and wearier. And in the middle of maybe the 20th take, he collapsed. With no doctor on the set, the stricken star was rushed to the hospital. But it was already too late. Within minutes, the 44-year-old actor had died of a massive heart attack. Came on the radio in the car, and I absolutely refused to believe what I heard. I waited about half an hour, then I called back, and I said, did you really mean, I mean, is he just in the hospital maybe? And he said, no, Evie, he's gone. The funeral was held at Hollywood Memorial Park. Motion picture luminaries came to pay their respects, and lifelong friend Cesar Romero delivered the eulogy. He was a beautiful man, he said. Beautiful outside and beautiful inside. We shall all miss him. Rest well, my friend. As fate would have it, two months after the actor's death, the son he'd always wanted, Tyrone Power III, was born. In the end, Tyrone Power achieved all he'd hoped for. He had proved that he was not merely a movie star, but an actor of stature, worthy of his heritage. He's like one of the last of the nobility. There's never been anybody else like him. That's what makes stars. He was, he was unique. Sometimes you meet people in your life, you feel as though you... You've known them before, and I felt that way about time. You couldn't help but just like him immediately, and when you got to know him, you loved him. He was a very, very attentive, a very sweet father, but not, not long enough. I would have liked to have talked to him. I would have liked to have hugged him. I would have liked to have just had a daddy. I think he watches out for us, and he's still with us. <laughs>